My name is Sean Moore, and I would like to welcome you with greetings of peace this evening on behalf of the Islamic Society of Tulsa. In the name of God, the most compassionate, most merciful. Over the next few hours, we will witness two unique religious perspectives. We will take advantage of one of the great gifts bestowed upon us by the founding fathers of this nation, the opportunity for freedom of speech and religion. I want to take a moment to recognize and commend you, the audience, for being of open and potentially curious mind and taking the time out of your busy schedules to attend this debate this evening, addressing the question, can Muslims and Christians be friends? To some of you, like myself, this question may seem out of context in the melting pot of the United States. in a land where I, raised as a Catholic, had the freedom to use my intellect and my rationale to make religious choices that were best suited for me individually. And indeed, those same rights allow us this evening to debate divergent viewpoints in a public forum. And we have the opportunity to take advantage of this this evening. I personally look forward to this opportunity. I also look forward to the conversations that take place after this debate in the hallways so that we can continue the discussions amongst ourselves. To use the words of Thomas Jefferson, he who knows best knows he knows little. Please note that there's a couple of tables Back in the back here, and there's um, literature and information available from, from both sides. And I, I extend to you um, to go and, and take advantage of the opportunity to collect some of this and to educate yourselves. Um, there's water in the room. That's available for all. Um, also, the, the restrooms are outside of security. If you need them now, you may be taking a long time to get back in um, because of the lines, and, and we apologize for the security situation and, and appreciate you guys standing in line as long as you did. Um, for the Muslims that are here tonight, we will be praying Isha the night prayer 15 minutes after the program is over. Okay. On September 11th of last year, a couple of Tulsa Muslims attended a peace march organized by Pastor Safa. After his, yeah, um, excuse me, at his church, after three sermons, and just prior to the start of the peace march, one of the Muslims, Muhyiddin Khadr, challenged Pastor Safa to a debate based on Pastor Safa's contention that Christians and Muslims cannot be friends. That is how we ended up where we are this evening. Furthermore, Muhyiddin Khadr was asked by Mr. Safa to apologize for challenging Mr. Safa's integrity that day. Although Mr. Cotter was willing to publicly apologize this evening at this event, Mr. Safa graciously accepted Mr. Cotter's apology in private and deemed that it wasn't necessary to take up time tonight during this event to restate that apology publicly. I would like to thank Mr. Safa for his graciousness as well as his willingness to attend this debate this evening. In light of this evening's, uh, um, I find it important to recognize uh, that ignorance often leads humankind to bigotry, and in turn, bigotry leads to division. I hope that this evening results in building a stronger community in Tulsa through better understanding, as well as empathy towards divergent viewpoints. To use the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, education is all a matter of building bridges. We are fortunate this evening and honored to have the respectable Hannibal Johnson, who will be acting as our moderator for the debate. For those of you who are not familiar with Hannibal, he has an outstanding CV and continues to unselfishly volunteer his time for the betterment of the Tulsa community. Hannibal is a distinguished author, attorney, and has served as president 
for Leadership Tulsa, Tulsa Urban League, as well as the Northeast Oklahoma Black Lawyers Association. Hannibal has also been recognized by a plethora of organizations, much too long of a list for me to mention here in my brief comments tonight, um, but you can find his honors in the program this evening. At this time, I now become one of you, a member of the audience, and I look forward with an open mind as Hannibal leads us through the next few hours. I'm honored to present to you Hannibal Johnson. Thank you, Sean, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Hannibal Johnson, your moderator for this evening's program. Tonight, we'll explore a straightforward question that we sometimes dance around. Can Christians and Muslims be friends? Thanks to the Islamic Society of Tulsa, the sponsor of tonight's forum, for securing this wonderful facility and making all the other logistical arrangements necessary to make this event a success. Thanks also to Mohadeen Khadr and Cheryl Siddiqui for their hard work and attention to detail in connection with tonight's forum. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming out this evening for what promises to be an engaging and provocative discussion. The question of how Christians and Muslims relate to one another looms large in this community and others. Tonight, we'll confront that question forthrightly from both sides. That we are here this evening addressing issues of mutual respect and understanding is itself a hopeful sign. Way back in 1919, Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes compared America to a marketplace of ideas. His philosophy was that the free expression of ideas is essential to a vibrant democracy, and that, in his words, the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. We assemble here this evening in that same spirit, to share, to listen, and to learn. Respect is paramount as we come together in the true spirit of community. It is imperative that we maintain decorum. Our goal is to shed light, not generate heat. While we may not agree with some of the things we hear this evening, let us vow to show respect to those who say them. Indeed, we respect ourselves by showing respect for others, particularly those with whom we disagree. Please, no applause catcalls, verbal outbursts, or even praises. If you get carried away, you will be carried away. <laughs> Just a few more housekeeping details. If you have a cell phone, please set it on silent ring mode or preferably turn it off. The use of a cell phone will prompt an immediate warning and may result in expulsion from the hall. No recording devices are allowed in the hall and security will escort any person deemed unruly from the hall. Thank you in advance for your understanding and your cooperation. You'll notice that there are peacekeepers stationed around the room. They're the folks in the white shirts and, and white vests with identification badges. Well, some of them have white shirts, not all of them. Christians, Jews, Muslims, the peacekeepers are volunteers who are serving as our host. They will assist us in maintaining an atmosphere of respect and order. The peacekeepers will also collect written questions from you, the audience. Our panelists, visible and respected religious figures with perspective and insight, will help us understand the nuances inherent in our focus question. Our guest speakers are, first, Dr. Jamal Badaway. Jamal A. Badaway, Ph.D., is Professor Emeritus at St. Mary's University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, where he served as Professor of both Management and religious studies. He completed his undergraduate studies in Cairo, Egypt, and his master's and PhD degrees at Indiana University. Dr. Badaway is the author of several works on Islam, including books, book chapters, and articles. In addition to his participation in lectures, seminars, and interfaith dialogues in North America, Dr. Badaway is a frequent guest speaker on Islam in nearly 32 other countries. He is a board member of the Islamic Juridical Council of North America, the European Council of Fatwa and Research, and the International Union of Islamic Scholars. He has served as a volunteer imam of the local Muslim community in Halifax since 1970. And our second pa panelist is Pastor Reza Safa. Pastor Reza F. Safa was born and raised a devout Shiite Muslim in Iran. His father was a poet and a Muslim scholar. Pastor Safa heard the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the first time in Sweden 
from some of that country's missionaries. He converted to Christianity. Pastor Safa founded the Harvester's World Outreach, a worldwide evangelistic and healing ministry based here in Tulsa. For the past 20 years, he has held crusades and pastor's conferences in nearly 50 countries, reaching thousands of people in India, Africa, Eastern Europe, and the former Soviet Union. People of all religions, especially those from Muslim and Hindu backgrounds, have converted to Christianity as a result of his outreaches around the world. Pastor Safa is also the founder and president of TBN Nejat TV, the first full-time Christian satellite network in the Persian language. He pastors Fisherman's House Church here in Tulsa. Through his television ministry and Islam awareness seminars, he has ministered to and educated people in the United States and beyond. Thank you, gentlemen, for lending your time and considerable wisdom and insight to this event. If we are to move ahead in Christian-Muslim relations, we must begin at the beginning with constructive dialogue. Your presence here this evening signals your commitment to moving our community forward, and for that, we appreciate you. Our format is as follows. Each speaker will be given a maximum of 30 minutes to address the focus question. Can Christians and Muslims be friends? We will proceed alphabetically. After both gentlemen have concluded their opening statements, each speaker will have an additional 15 minutes for a rebuttal. We will again proceed alphabetically. Questions from you, the audience, will be accepted on index cards that were distributed to you earlier. If you have a question, simply print it legibly on the index card. Please keep your questions concise and respectful. Note on your index card whether your question is directed to Dr. Badawi, Pastor Safa, or both. Once you're done, please hold up the card so that one of the peacekeepers may collect it. During the 15-minute break following the final rebuttal, three questions for each of our panelists will be selected. Once we reconvene after the break, I will present those questions to them. Each gentleman will have an allotted response time of up to three minutes per question. We wish that time permitted us the opportunity to address more of your questions, but alas, we'd be here all night and well into tomorrow if we took on each and every question. We apologize in advance to those of you whose questions time does not allow us to pose. Please be advised and or reminded that there will be an open house at the mosque tomorrow. The open house will present an additional opportunity for you to pose any lingering questions. So we're ready to begin our forum. As we previously discussed, gentlemen, this is a scholarly and theological debate. Just as we, as we expect the audience to be respectful of you in this event, we expect you to be respectful of one another. Let's stay on our topic, which is, again, can Christians and Muslims be friends and refrain from personal attacks? Let's get started with Dr. Badawi. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, uh, Pastor Safa, Mr. Hannibal, and all my brothers and sisters from all faith communities, I greet you with the common greeting of all of the prophets. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, blessing, and mercy of God Almighty be with you all. Just a quick word of thanks and appreciation for your warm welcome prior to arrival and after arrival, and I thank you for that. My, asp my style in presenting the topic, as I usually do in my classrooms, just to be concise, is to tell you what I hope to cover. A very brief introduction, and I give you my short answer to the question, can Muslims and friends and Christian be friends? Secondly, I'm going to you to borrow the term from Mr. Hannibal, theological, 15 theological reasons for why I say yes. Thirdly, why there are some sometimes obstacles in the way of that friendship. If I have time, I might deal also with some examples of common errors and misinterpretation of the text of the Quran and what is the methodological flows in this uh, kind of positions taken and where to go uh, from there. If I don't get enough time for common errors 
I'm not running away from it. I hope to get into that during the rebuttal period. My short answer, can Muslims and Christians be friends? The answer, they can, they should. There have been many instances in the past where they were friends, and in many cases, they are already friends. I could spend the half hour elaborating on this. Suffice to say that there were periods of history, in spite of all of the conflict in the past, where Muslims, Christian, Jews, and other people of various faith communities were cooperating together under Muslim Spain in Darul Hikmah or Bayt al Hikmah, the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, all of them working together, irrespective of their difference in faith, towards the advancement of the good of society at large. Now, let me get to reasons. The more important, okay, that's fine. Thank you. I have plan B. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, you forgive me here for not going into detailed quotation of verses in the Quran. I might be making just a summary because there are so many of them already. But I give the chapter and verse, the column that separates between the num number of the chapter and the verse. One is that Christians and Muslims both believe in the one universal God, the creator, sustainer, and cherisher of the universe. The name in English is God, but Jesus did not speak English anyway. In French, it's Dieu. In Arabic, it is Allah, the identical term that Christian Arabs use and is found in the Christian Bible. And in Aramaic, the likely language of the blessed Jesus, peace be upon him, Allaha, which is strikingly similar to the Arabic term Allah. We're not talking about different gods. Uh, different religions might have differing understanding about God, especially the Abrahamic religions, but it doesn't mean that he's a different God. Secondly, because there is a general acceptance in both communities of the prophets of God who were chosen to convey and exemplify his message to the humankind. In fact, in the Quran there are names of 25 prophets. The great majority of them are biblical prophets, but there were other prophets in Arabia also outside of this, but most are biblical prophets. It is an article of faith in Islam to believe in, respect, and honor all of those prophets. There are verses in the Quran. These are only samples, the number I have. A third reason, that particularly in Muslim-Christian relationship, there is something unique. I call it Jesus as a common link, and I spoke on that in several lectures, a common link between Muslims and Christians. It is indeed, yes, different perception of Jesus, but nothing to do with any disrespect. In fact, Jesus, peace be upon him, is mentioned in the Quran in more than 10 chapters, more than 90 verses, is described as a word from God, as a spirit from God, as one who is honored in this life and the life to come, and among those who are closest to God. I challenge anyone to show me any negative word said about Jesus in the Quran. Same respect is shown to Mary, after her name, a whole chapter in the Quran, number 19, takes its name. There are many women mentioned in the Quran. Women mentioned in the Quran. Only one woman is mentioned by name. She is not the mother of Prophet Muhammad. She is not the wife of Prophet Muhammad. She is not the beloved daughter of Prophet Muhammad. The only woman mentioned by name in the Quran is the Blessed Mary, the mother of Jesus. The fourth reason. The moral anchor of both communities of faith. You go and read the Quran and read your Bible. When it speaks clearly about kindness to parents, to relatives, prohibition of all indecencies, charity, you name it. In fact, as Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, summarized it. He says, I was sent only to perfect good manners and good behavior. And in one hadith or saying, he said, Ad-Dinul Mu'amala, which means real religion is how we treat each other, not what we claim uh, triumphantly about our theology. How do we deal with one another? The fifth reason that the Quran speaks about human dignity, not Muslim dignity, believer's dignity, Abrahamic dignity, human. 
It is interesting to notice that in the Quran, it, if it addresses Muslims concerning their particular obligation like prayer, fasting, and so on, it says, O oh, believers. When it speaks about universalistic concept, the Quran says, O oh, humankind. And when the Quran speaks about dignity, it uses the broad term, we have honored, it says, this is God speaking as Muslim believe. Indeed, we honor the children of Adam, which is quite inclusive. Number six, there is also a common concept in my humble interpretation that a human being is created here on earth. In the Quran, it's called trustee. In the Bible, it's called stewards on this earth to fulfill the will of God and to live the way that pleases God. Seven, affirmation of the sanctity of life. You read the Quran in chapter 5, verse 32, and if you're familiar with your Bible, you find that they're all almost identical. No wonder because revelation comes from the same source from God. And the Quran say that indeed this was revealed also to the Israelites, that if you kill one person without justification, it is like killing the whole of the human race. If you save one life, it is like saving the whole race, human race. Number nine, or eight, that both teach equality and ethnic diversity. We find that in the Bible, Hebrew scriptures, as well as New Testament, and we find it expressed even very eloquently in the Quran, uh, gave only two examples. In chapter 30, verse 22, for example, it says, uh, of the signs of God, mean the sign of his mercy and wisdom and goodness, is the creation of heavens and earth and the diversity of your languages and your complexion. The ninth reason, that both face, in terms of normative teaching, not deviations of people, condemn any coercion of faith. The Quran says it very clearly in many verses. One of them is frequently quoted, let there be no coercion in the matter of faith. The tenth reason, to accept religious diversity without fanaticism. Uh, the Quran says if God wanted, he would have made all people one nation. The, another verse even goes specifically even to religious diversity. It says if God wanted, he could have made all people believers, i.e. believers in one particular theology. It is up to God to judge people, but we have to accept that there are many sincere and faithful people with all good intention in the world who have chosen different path towards God. It is God who determines ultimately who is right and who is wrong. Of course, the Quran does speak about what is right and what is wrong, like any other scriptures. But it's not to, up to us to punish people for having the wrong choice. Number 12, or is it 11? 11, we're still there. Universal human brotherhood. I know that in the Quran there are verses that speak about brotherhood of the believers. So is the case with Christians as well. But there is a very beautiful verse in the Quran frequently quoted, chapter 49, verse 13, when God addresses again not Muslims, but all humans. All humans. It's all mankind. We created you male and female. And we made you into nations and tribes that you may get to know and recognize one another. Indeed, the most honored of you in the sight of God is the one who is most righteous. I liken it always to the bouquet of flower. The white flower is beautiful in, in its own right. So is the red, the yellow, the pink, but more beautiful are all of them together. Allah could have created only one color of flowers. He had also diversity in people's uh, races and ethnic groups. Twelve, that in my humble understanding, both communities of faith, theologically, believe in universal justice. And the Quran says justice is not a political correctness. Didn't exactly, I'm just rewording to. It says you do justice for the sake of God, not for the sake of uh, appearing to be nice or good. It is a command from Allah. It says you do justice even if it goes against yourself or your close kins. And then in one verse, it speaks about justice with the enemy. It says don't let the hatred of others to you dissuade you from being just do justice, this is closer to piety. Thirteen, that's a most important one in my humble mind. 
both believe in peaceful coexistence if you eliminate some of the fanatical fringe on both sides. Let me tell you uh, this verse, I give you just translation of meaning in free you know, style, which many scholars, many discerning scholars in Islam consider the foundation of relationship between Muslims and all other communities of faith. They consider that to be the norm. Any other thing would be exception, such as response to aggression. And basically it says, God does not forbid you, O Muslims. With respect to those, meaning other communities, who did not fight you because of your religion, or drive you out of your homes, that you should deal with them in kindness and justice. Kindness and justice. Indeed, God loves those who do justice. Fourteen, I believe also, and I stand corrected, if I'm saying something wrong about Christianity, I stand corrected. Both believe in moderation, not extremism. If you really understand the scripture properly, I know scriptures of all people have been abused by some people to come up with their own agenda. But reading sincerely and objectively will show that moderation is a requirement. In the Quran, it speaks about moderation as the hallmark of true Muslims who implement their faith. And the Prophet condemned, as did the Quran, what is called the ghulu, or exaggeration, or excess even in the matter of worship. There's always that just balance. Fifteenth, that the teaching of all prophets who proceeded after all from God is a teaching of mercy, not cruelty or brutality. And when people commit those cruelties, it is their fault, not the fault of the teaching. In the Quran, it describes the mission of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as mercy unto, not Muslims only, the worlds, which actually translate mercy to human, Muslims, other communities. He gave instruction about mercy to animals, mercy to, in the use of plantation, resources, are all have been already there 1,400 years ago in the teaching of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Suffice to say, when I conclude this, that the most repeated attribute of God in the Quran come from a root that, from mercy, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. It appears in the beginning of 113 out of the 114 chapters in the Quran. And it's oft repeated concept throughout the Quran. We're not talking about a, a judgment, judgmental, cruel God. He is just, yes, but the most oft repeated attribute of God relate to mercy. But why is it that there might be sometimes barrier to friendship? I think one of the most serious problems is to mix between normative ideal teaching of Islam as found in its authentic sources with what Muslims are doing. And we have to be upfront and honest with each other and with God. Muslim as people are imperfect. But let me ask you this. Who is in all other faith communities? Secondly, some of the Muslim cultural practices that are falsely attributed to Islam because it's happening in a country that majority are Muslims have nothing to do with Islam. It is baseless. It is grave misunderstanding, if not outright violation. Then we have to be clear again between Islamic culture based on Islam and Muslim cultures that could deviate dramatically from Islam. We have to realize also that a possible reason of tension in the world today is injustice. And injustice, as condemned by all communities of faith, could actually provide the ground for radical ideas and for extremist ideas and ideologies to emerge. And when we say we should also understand some of the causes of those injustices, we're not saying, let's look for some justification, for there is absolutely no justification of aggression against innocent people, none whatsoever. But to understand so that we can deal with the problem at the root. There is the media stereotype. When the war was going on in Northern Ireland, nobody called that Protestant terrorism, Catholic terrorism, or Christian terrorism. But unfortunately, constantly in the media, acts of terror, which I stood publicly against in several uh, statements issued in the United States, in Canada, and elsewhere, 
And there is a, a whole lot of material that's available on this. Um, that term actually seemed to con connect Islam as a teaching with those deviant acts. Just like saying Christian terrorism because they were Timothy McVeigh or someone else who did a horrible thing or Yona Bamber. So we have to be, have that integrity and I need an appeal to the media. Disconnect the term Islamic from it. A terror act, a crime cannot be called a Christian, Jewish or Muslim crime. It is a crime period and condemned by the scriptures of all. There may be a problem with some historical legacies. Yes, we need to study history, but some people are blocked and frozen in history. They don't see the future nor aspire to a better future. Many times there is lots of focus on extremist acts. It is just like we say that nobody will see headline in the paper tomorrow, a good Samaritan did such and such good act. But when there is violence, there is all kind of allegations, you know, that's what really attracts. Me media is a business, and business will not sell without that sensationalism. But there are some problems there. There is also the post 9-11, a tragic event that was condemned in hours by myself and by all major Islamic organizations following that Islamic councils and scholars throughout the world. Uh, the, the way it was sensationalized, you know, when you get the pictures and keep repeating over and over again, created images that unfortunately reinforced this association between people. But I must say in honesty that some actions also on the part of Muslims, contrary to what Islam teaches, seem to reinforce those prejudices and those misconceptions. They are partly responsible for it. But then there are also grave errors in interpreting the primary sources in Islam. Let me just give a few points, and I hope tomorrow I could go in more details in answering questions. First of all, for Muslims, the only sacred sources, primary sources based on revelation in their belief, is the Quran that they believe to be the word of God dictated to the Prophet through Angel Gabriel, and the sound hadith, because not all hadith is sound, sound and authentic hadith of the Prophet, which is revelation only in meaning, but it doesn't have the exact accuracy like the word of the Qur'an in terms of its uh, preservation. That is why any hadith that sounds different from the Qur'an must be understood only in the light of the Qur'an. Hadith does not supersede the Qur'an. The principles in the Qur'an take precedence. Uh, there are also cases where you get councils of scholars passing opinions, but an opinion by a scholar is not infallible. There is no central figure in Islam, at least in Sunni Islam, that's about 90%. And it's not even that much different. It might be some different, somewhat different in Shiite, among Shiite Muslims. But for more than 90% of Muslims, the opinion of any scholar is subject to debate. And even in a scholarly councils, a resolution may pass by majority, they could be minority, they could be people who abstained, but we have to keep that in mind also that it is not always one binding thing on 1.6 billion Muslims. There are problems also, drastic problems with the language. The Quran is available between our hands in the exact original Arabic uttered by the Prophet 1400 years ago. That's unique among word scriptures. We don't have just a translation or something that was written later. Now, oftentimes, translation is not easy. I know it's not easy in the Bible as well. But there are dramatic problems even among some Muslim translators of the Quran, if not even people who try to translate in a way to spin the meaning in one direction or the other. A word in Arabic, and it's a very rich, rich language, could have multiple meanings. And you don't just take the lexical meaning, you have to take the contextual meaning that is suitable for that particular uh, context. There are cases where the Qur'an uses a term that seems to be general, but it means only a few people. When it sometimes uses Jews, Christians, or even Muslims for that matter. It doesn't mean all of them. If you study the historical context, the occasion of revelation, it means only some, but doesn't apply to all across the board. And this is one of the most serious problems with interpretation. Disregarding historical context, 
the Quran was an interactive scripture guiding a community, revealed piecemeal over a period of 23 years. And there are information available when this verse, not all verses, but there are some crucial verses in the Quran that were revealed in a given setting, a question or a problem that faced the community. And unless one is aware of that, you can go awry in giving all your own interpretation without any ground. Furthermore, Islam was born like, Arm, uh, what's the name, Karen Armstrong say, was born in a very violent and hostile world. And unless we understand the kind of danger that sought to destroy the Muslim community, then we can't understand why some verses speak about fighting those who are trying to destroy them. Without context, we say, oh, the Quran say, go and do this and do that, without relating to the historical reality in which they lived. And I'm sure that many of those areas are familiar with our brothers and sisters from other clergy, Jewish and Christian clergy, called hermeneutics. You don't just take a text from the Bible and give it the meaning that you want. You have to look at the context also as well. Also, no interpretation is valid of the Quran if it violates the basic Quranic values which I spoke about, the 15 reasons why Muslim and, friend and Christian can be friends. Let me, as much as time allows, gives you just a couple of examples of grossly misunderstood and frequently misquoted things. Why is it, if that is true, that the Quran incite its followers to engage in holy war? I am willing to pay a million dollars for anyone who shows me a single place in the entire Quran from A to Z that the Arabic equivalent of holy war appear even once. You know professors don't have millions, but I know what I'm talking about. Go to the concordance of the Quran, find one. None whatsoever. It is a big myth. Some people say it's translation of jihad. That's not. I'll explain jihad in a minute. Secondly, holy war is an oxymoron. What is so holy about loss of life, injury, destruction, suffering? It is a, an oxymoron. Thirdly, the term holy war is an English term that emerged, as we all know, in medieval times when people hiding behind the good name of Christ committed all kinds of atrocities purportedly in his name. And that was the kind of holy word that descended later even in intra-Christian type of fighting. Nothing to do with the real teaching of the scriptures or the great prophets. The term that we use in Islam is jihad. We are proud of that term, jihad, understood properly. It comes from a root in Arabic which means to exert maximum effort. A legal process of interpreting law in the Quran is called ijtihad and has also the three words. It's come from the same root because it means a scholar exerting maximum intellectual effort to find a solution to a contemporary problem based on the broad guidance of the Quran but not specifically mentioned there like organ transplant or, or the like. If you go to the Quran and they give you some sample verses, you find that the usage, at least as the way I divide them, you could divide them differently, but come to the same thing. That the Quran speaks also about jihad al-nafs. Yes, that is to struggle against evil within oneself. And that is the highest form of jihad to start with. The, the essential jihad is to struggle against evil within oneself. Hatred, violence, personal agendas. That's a harder one than fighting in the battle. It is used in the Quran to refer to what you might call social jihad. The payment of charity to the poor is called a form of jihad as well. Making your argument on the basis of the Quran is called making jihad with the Quran. Exactly the term used in chapter 25 in the Quran. But yes, indeed, there is a third level of jihad. You can call it combative jihad. But actually, the term for that in Arabic in more accurately is qital, not jihad itself, even though it's included, because only a subset. Combative jihad is allowed only in two cases. And there is another million, if you show me, from the Quran, and that's directed to Muslim also, a third reason. One is to repel unprovoked aggression. It says, fight those who fight against you. You find that, chapter 2. The reference is there, go and read it, 190. Second reason, in the same section, Fight until there is no more oppression. And even though the word might have originally in Arabic several meanings, but the t context speaks about Muslims who are driven from their homes, i.e. oppression by the Meccans against the Muslim community. There is no other reasons. 
In fact, the first verses in the Quran that were revealed after thir- more than 13 years of patience in the face of insult, harassment, uh, false propaganda, torture, in some cases killing of the believers in Mecca, 13 years they didn't lift a finger. The first time the verse gave them the right to answer back and to defend themselves actually says exactly that, because they have been wronged, not because they are expanding or they are more powerful now in Medina. The verse I cited earlier in chapter 60, that you should treat in kindness and justice those who are not fighting you because of your religion or driving you out of your home. Okay, that's the least I need now. Okay. There is, however, a strict code of ethics, even if you have to do that. One is to exhaust peaceful means, to spare non-combatants, and the Prophet spoke clearly about women who are not fighting, children, uh, clergy, old people, and actually even young people who are not carrying arms and threatening your life. Uh, humane treatment of the POWs, refraining from destruction. Are Muslims told in the Quran to kill Jews and Christians whenever they find them? Absolutely false. To start with, the verse used the term mushrik, which means idolatrous. And that term was never used in the Quran to describe Jews and Christians. Secondly, the historical context I told you about. They tried to destroy them even after they migrated to Medina. They committed crimes against them, including breaking the peace treaty that the Prophet negotiated with them and killing innocent people. This is what we call today war crimes. A Muslim is allowed to marry a Christian woman or Jewish woman. If the Quran says, really, kill Jews and Christians, the first thing at the wedding night is to fetch his wife and cut her throat. Um, okay, I'll skip that. I'll come to that in the other one because I see I have only one minute, but I wanted to correct one thing. You should not take Jews and Christians for friends. There is a big mistake here in translation to start with. The Arabic term used in that verse is not friendship. It is to look up to them for protection. And if you look carefully at the verses where it prohibits Muslims from doing that, it is because of negative reasons, including that they mocked your religion. Who in the world in his right mind would go to some, not all, some individuals who mock their faith and say, I would like to make alliance for you to protect me. Respecting time, I think I have only 37 seconds. I'll take, give you a rain check for that, but there will be something more, hopefully, in the rebuttal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Badawi. 30 minutes has a way of sneaking up on a speaker, so it goes really quickly. Now it's time to hear from Pastor Safa. Pastor? Thank you very much. I'd like to start with a word of prayer. And those of you who believe in the name of Lord Jesus, you can bow your head with me and pray. Father, we thank you this night for, your, for this gathering of men and women that want to know the truth. Lord, we honor you tonight and bless your wonderful and holy and precious and everlasting name. Father, I thank you for you were so willing that to curse Jesus on the cross for the sins of humanity, including all Muslims. Thank you that you loved me as a Muslim so much that you sent Jesus for my sake because I couldn't reach your level of righteousness. I did so hard, Lord, you know it, for 20 years non-stop working as a Muslim. And you touched me and you changed me because of what Jesus did. And tonight, Father, I pray that every Muslim friend that we have here Everyone who's searching the truth and want to know the truth. I pray that you touch him with a special way, Father God, tonight. Just like you touched me 20-some years ago. And also, I pray for Dr. Badawi. Lord, I pray for, the, for also a special touch upon this friend of ours. And I pray that you touch him in Jesus' name. And Master, they, they have a great zeal for you, Lord God. And they need to know the truth. So again, we thank you and we honor you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. 
Uh, again, I want to thank uh, the Islamic Society of Tulsa, Honorable Hannibal Johnson, wonderful brother in the Lord, and uh, Dr. Badal, we thank you so much for coming all the way from uh, uh, Canada. Uh, just get one thing straight here. Uh, the reason I'm here uh, to do this debate is because the Islamic Society of Tulsa, or to begin with, Mr. Uh, as, as Sean said, one of the members, three of the members, came into our prayer meetings, broken in the middle of my prayer meetings, and asked me for, challenged me to debate within 30 days, which I gave him a date. Uh, I was 35 days. It was September 11, and the next date I had available was October 26, I believe. And of course, uh, they informed me that they couldn't till this day today. So it's four months afterward. And uh, I know this is not intentional. Ms. Siddiqui, you said in Tulsa World that Siddiqui said the Islamic society prefers dialogue to debate, but that Safa would not agree to that. That's not the truth. Probably uh, Bill Sherman got it wrong. Bill, if you're here, please correct us. Because they passed a flyer, as Mr. Sean said, challenged me to debate before I even knew that they existed. Anyhow, so uh, nobody ever told me anything about dialogue. I've been dialoguing with the Muslims for the past 20 some years. And so I have no problem with dialogue, but they wanted a debate and they got it. So that's, get that straight. You know, I always uh, wonder what is our opinion about God? First of all, I want to say this because I'm going to bring a lot of stuff here and I don't want to provoke uh, our Muslim friends. God is not intimidated by your or my opinion about Him. He is a lot bigger than you can uh, get Him scared of what you think about Him. So some of the stuff that I'm saying here, it's for your sake to test it. Because I know I was a Muslim, and I challenge any of you that was more radical than I was. And in that time, I was hungry for God. I want to know God. For 20 years I prayed. Not one time God answered my prayer. Not one time. But that night that I prayed to Jesus, after six months of fighting the Bible and trying to find fault in it, I prayed to Him. And I said, are you God? Show yourself up to me. Following morning when I woke up to do my namaz, I heard the voice of God for the first time in my life. I thought, wow, this is amazing. I've been praying for 20 years, no answer. One time I called his name and he answered me. And ever since he's been leading me and answering me. And uh, so that's the reason. Why can't Christians and Muslims be friends? Well, our Bible commands us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. It says, he who does not have love does not know God because God is love. 1 John chapter 3, verse 15, he says, He who hates his brother, meaning another person, is a murderer, and no murderer has eternal life. So we as a Christian, born again, born of God's Spirit and of His Word, cannot hate anyone. That's why the scripture says in 1 Peter chapter 3, he says, You are called to bless and not to curse. So even those who curse you pray for their blessings. And so... And that's our practice. That's what I've been doing for the past 20 some years, ministering among Muslims. I get a threat on my life on a weekly basis from our Muslim friends around the world. And we pray for them. Can Christian and Muslim be friends? From our side, some misinterpreted my saying, of course we can. That's what we are all dealing with. That's what our entire ministry is all about. Why would I want to deal with a group of people that constantly want to threat my life? What business do I have to do, deal with them if I didn't love them? But the, the problem is the Quran, the problem is the hadith, a hadith, the problem is the tradition, and the problem is 1500 years of history. We can eliminate all of that, and I'm going to read a bunch, and I'm sure Dr. Badawi is going to come and spin it. But we could go to what is happening in 51 nations on the planet Earth today. Not a single Islamic nation today treat Christians right. Not a single one of them. As a matter of fact, I have a file here. If I have time, I'm going to read of, uh, according to some of the UN statements what these nations do to Christian minorities. So this idea of, you know, Dr. Badawi give us 17 points or 16 points 
It's a utopia that doesn't exist, has never existed in 1500 years, and I'm here to prove it. Let's just start with Islamic society of Tulsa. Now, according to Webster Dictionary, a friend is one who attached to another by affection. Friendship is based, a friend is the one who attached to another by affection or esteem. esteem. One that is not hostile. Three, one that is of the same nation, party, or group. Four, one that favors a, or promotes something as a charity. Four, five, a favorite companion. Point number one, could our friendship, the Muslim society, and Reza Safa be based on one that is not hostile? You or I are not hostile towards you. In the community update, Islamic Society of Tulsa Newsletter, issue 34, October 07, and please correct me if I'm misreading the English part of it. We probably need some of you to translate this first. Four Poisons of the Heart, the article from works of Ibn Rajab, al Hanabali, and several other people. Forgive me if I'm misreading these names. There are four points. I'm going to go to the fourth point because of uh, the time. The fourth category includes, it says, unnecessary companionship is a chronic disease that causes much harm. This is the IST, the Islamic Society of Tulsa saying this. The fourth category includes those people whose company is doomed itself. It is like taking poison. Its victim either finds an antidote or perishes. Many people belong to this category. Are you in that category? Are Christians in that category? I'm wondering. They are the people of religious innovation and misguidance. Those who abandon the sunnah of the messenger of Allah. That's me. I abandon the sunnah of messenger of Allah because it didn't work for me. And advocate other beliefs. That's me. I advocate other beliefs. So according to this article, I am a poison to your companionship. Why would you want to be my friend? They call what is the sunnah a bidah. And vice versa, a man with any intellect should not sit in their assemblies, nor mix with them. If I'm reading this right, I'm questioning your intellect tonight, with all due respect. Now, you can read that, there is, there is a site there, you can go and read the whole article, get a better understanding of it. Point number two, could our friendship be based on one that favors or promotes something as a charity? You know, I spoke with one of the members of the Tulsa, Islamic Tulsa, members of your mosque. He says, in public, they go to interfaith meetings and make speeches for coexistence of Muslims, Christians, and Jews. And in private, they curse the very same people and sow seeds of hatred in young minds, their ultimate objective. I rather not believe in this because I am the type that what you tell me, I believe in it. But then I want to examine that. I had point number two, that uh, point number two, I have to cancel the whole thing because uh, prior to this service, it uh, appeared that I, uh, I will be attacking Dr. Badawi and his opinions. There is a one site, although I want to encourage you to get on islamonline.net, where Mr. Badawi oftentimes puts his teaching on there and find out what those people believe in. As a matter of fact, there are many fatwas in Arabic section of that. Those of you who know Arabic, I recommend you get on that site tonight and find out about what the fatwa is from some of the uh, great scholars of the Middle East, that is friends of uh, Mr. Badawi, Yusuf Qardawi is one of them. Uh, what does he say about Christians and the Jewish people, the people of the book? I, I go to point number three. Could our friendship be based upon a favored companion? Surah chapter 5, verse 51 says, I want to look at what this surahs and the uh, hadith says. Uh, hadith says. Surah chapter 5, verse 51 says, O you who believe, talking to Muslim, take not the Jews and the Christians for your friends and protectors. They are but friends and protectors to each other. And he amongst you that turns to them for friendship is of them. Verily, Allah guide is not a people unjust. Now, I'm, I understand English. And Mr. Badawi stands on the subject that this word friendship is wrong translated. Well, I would like to have a translation of the Quran that really corrects this because there are many translations that says do not make 
uh, Christians and Jews your friends. So I am just a third party reading these verses, and that's what I made my assumption according into this, what I'm reading. Now, according to Mr. Badawi, he says, and, and according to the Islamic scholarship, we cannot interpret the Quran by itself. The reason for it is, the Quran was revealed to Muhammad in a period of 23 years, 12, 13 years in Mecca, 10 years in Medina. And these verses that came to Muhammad did not come. He was, according to their knowledge, he was illiterate. So he would speak out the verse he would hear, or the angel appeared to him by various means, or so on and so forth. Then he would speak it out, and his companions would write it down or remember it. We call them hafiz, meaning the people that remember it. Now, when they put these verses together and the chapters, there is no chronological order to the Quran. There are 114 surahs, 114 surahs, which means chapters. So they took the longest surah first and the shortest surah last. Now, these surahs in the rebuttal, we will talk about the formation of surahs and how Osman came when he put all of these together. There were many copies. He destroyed, uh, I understand, three-fourths of that compi compilation, and he put one. And that's why there are so many controversies in the Quran, and if we have time, we will talk about it. Uh, so here, I'll, now he said we have to adjust the surah, we have to interpret it in according to its setting. If you understand, surah chapter 5 was a Medina surah, the latter time of Muhammad's life. And his condition with the Jews and Christians completely changed in the latter time of his, his life. And this is what the surahs or the hadith, hadith says. Sahih Muslim, which is by the way, if you question Sahih Muslim about his hadith, I question you because he is the most renowned uh, uh, man, that uh, scholar that uh, everybody on this planet, even the, 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 the uh, uh, Shiite Muslim believe in his collection of his hadith. Sahih Muslim is a collection of saying and deeds of Prophet Muhammad, also known as the Sunnah. The reports of the Prophet's sayings and deeds are called a hadith. Muslim lived a couple of, uh, this gentleman, lived a couple of centuries after the Prophet's death and worked extremely hard to collect his uh, hadith. Each report in his collection was checked for compatibility with the Quran. In other words, he, he rejected a lot of those hadith that would not fit the Quran. So everything in his collection fits with the teaching of the Quran. And he says, uh, <clears throat> and, the, uh, and the veracity of the chain of reporters had to be painstakingly established. Muslims' collection is recognized by the overwhelming majority of the Muslim world to be one of the most authentic collection of the sunnah of the Prophet. In his article, The, the Nature of the Islamic Political System on IslamOnline.net, Dr. Badawi, he writes, the Quran, and I'm quoting what he's saying. The Quran and prophetic tradition are the ultimate constitution, which is different from the secular constitution because it cannot be changed. On the same side, Dr. Khalid Alvi, another scholar, he says the Quran is very clear in expressing its view on the position of the Prophet. According to the Quran, the Prophet has four capacities and he must be obeyed in every capacity. Hadith is nothing but a reflection of the personality of the Prophet who is to be obeyed at every cost. These are two scholars stating these facts, many others similar to that. Here is book 26, number 5389 of Sahih Muslim. What does he say? He says about Christians. Abu Huraira reported a lost messenger, Muhammad, as saying, do not greet the Jews and the Christians before they greet you, and when you meet any one of them on the roads, force him to go to the narrowest part of it. That's what Hadith says. Book 41, number 5186. Narrated Abu Huraira, Suhail ibn Abu Salih said, I went out with my father to Syria. The people passed by the cloisters in, in which there were, there were Christians and began to salute them. My father said, do not give them salutation first. For Abu Hurairah reported the apostle of Allah say, see this is the second one. There are, there are many similar of the same kind in both uh, Sahih and also uh, in uh, Bukhari as well that, that state the same. He says, Allah is saying, do not salute them. Jews and Christians first, and when you meet them on the road, force them to go on the narrowest part of it. Now let's say, let's look at what, what, the, uh, what the Quran teaches. Are, are these fitting the teaching of the Quran? Now, 
The Muslim Islamic Society of Tulsa has accused me that I pull verses out of the Quran, out of its context, out of its setting. So what I'm doing, I'm reading the whole passage for you to understand. I'm, I'm sticking with what they are saying. Surah chapter 9, verse 28, starting with, O you who believe, Muslims, truly the pagans, now the word in Arabic is, if you see it on there, Al-Mushrikuna, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu enna ma mushrikuna najisun. All the mushrik, mushrik in Arabic means the one who associate partners with God. Someone who says, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. By the way, not, not Mary, but God the Holy Spirit. So these are mushrik, the people that are so, or pagans of the Saudi Arabia, of the Arabian Peninsula at that time, were idol worshippers, they were also mushrik. So we want to find out what this verse, who is he talking about? All, all the pagans or mushrik are najish, they're unclean. That's why when my family touched me, they washed their hands. Or that was our practice, Dr. Badawi, and uh, thank God the Islamic Society of Tulsa says, Sheryl Siddiqui assured me, they don't do that when they shake our hands. I like your version of Islam, and we want to stick with that version. And Moshrek is the one who associates partners to God. So let them not, after this year of theirs, approach the sacred mosque. And if you fear poverty, soon will Allah enrich you, if He wills out of His bounty, for Allah is all-knowing, all-wise. Now you have to understand that at that time there were many idol worshippers at that time. They did trade in, in the Arabian Peninsula. And so the Muslim would go bankrupt with these guys walking away and nobody do treat them, uh, nobody sh shake hands with them, and, and, and so on and so forth. But Allah is ensuring people that poverty is not going to grab them. And so we go on. Yusuf Ali, which is the one of the renowned translators of the Quran. He says, in his translation, in his commentary of above verse, uh, reference number 1280, he states, the pagans or al-mushrikun are a waning power bound to disappear. This actually happened. He says this actually happened. The pagans were extinguished from Arabia. Page 445 in that uh, uh, Islam, uh, the Quran translation by Yusuf Ali. Now, let's go to Sahih Bukhari. Volume 3, Book 39, Number 531. Narrated Ibn Omar. Omar the second Khalif expelled the Jews and the Christians from Hejaz. When Allah's Apostle had conquered Khaybar, again this is a hadith, I'm trying to match the hadith, or what they teach, the scholars teach, together with these verses. He wanted to expel the Jews from, its, from it, as its land became the property of Allah, His Apostle, and the Muslims. Allah's apostle intended to expel the Jews, but they requested him to let them stay there on the condition that they would be the labor, they would do the labor and get half of the fruits. Allah's apostle told them, we will let you stay on thus condition as long as we will. So they, i.e. Jews, kept on living there until Omar forced them to go towards Taima and Ariha. Surah chapter 9, back to the surah again. Verse 29. Fight, again that word in Arabic is qatallahum which also is translated kill or slay. Uh, many translations, you know, Yusuf Ali, including Yusuf Ali, they justify the language of the Quran in order to feed it to the Western mindset. Yusuf Ali, for instance, was a man who studied in England, studied actually theology in, uh, in a, in a, in a theo theological school in England. In order for him to understand the language of the Bible, he toned down much of the language of the Quran and unfortunately, many of you do not understand Arabic, and so you just take it what you read in English. So now, he says in verse 29, Fight or qatallahum, kill those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which has been forbidden by Allah and His Messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth. I do not acknowledge the religion of truth. How many of you Christians do not acknowledge Islam as a religion from God? Would you please raise your hand? If you dare, if you're not scared. Some of you are scared, put your hand down. But those of you, so all of these people that you saw raise their hand, they do not acknowledge the religion of truth. Even if they are of the people of the book, which means Christians and Jews, until they pay the jizaya. How many minutes did you say? I've got 10 moments. Jizaya, which is, uh, they translate it tax. But jizaya comes from, uh, jiza means, means punishment. You pay a penalty for something. Many Christians in from where Dr. Badawi comes from, from Egypt, today are paying Jaziah to many radical groups just for them to stay alive. Many of them have been executed because they refuse to pay it. That's been practiced, that's been packed of Omar for the past 1500 years. 
Uh, we could discuss it in de detail, but we don't have time. With willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Now, here is, if you go on internet, there is a site called Tafsir. Tafsir, www.tafsir.com. Uh, this is Ibn Kathir that is one of the most renowned scholar and commentator of the Quran. He was, uh, he was both mufassir, which means uh, something who, someone who tafsir does. Tafsir means commentate. And also Qadi, he was a very knowledgeable master of a scholar, master scholar of Islamic history. Uh, I really question if you question Mr. Kathir. Kathir says, paying jazai is a sign of kuf and disgrace. Allah said, until they pay the jazaya, if they do not choose to embrace Islam with willing submission in defeat and subservience and feel themselves subdued. That's what Christian, Christians are doing over 51 nations on the planet earth today in Muslim nations. Feel themselves subdued, disgraced, humiliated, and belittled. Therefore Muslims are not allowed to honor the people of Qaimah. That's again the Christians and the Jews. Or elevate them above Muslim, for they are miserable, disgraced, and humiliated. Muslim recorded from Abu Huraira that the Prophet said, do not initiate the salam to the Jews and Christians, and if you meet them, you already read that, so we don't need to repeat that. Surah chapter 9, verse 30. The Jews call you Zahir, son of Allah, and the Christians, see the whole thing, the whole, the whole passage is about Christians. We started from 9, 28, and we continue. The Jews called Uzair, son of Allah, which must have been a sect at that time by the Jewish people called Ezra, the son of God. We don't have any example of it. I don't know of any. And the Christian called Christ the son of Allah or the son of God. How many of you Christian believe Jesus was the son of God? Would you please raise your hand? Okay, so you're in this category. Verse 30. That is a saying from their mouth. In this, they but imitate what the unbelievers, kafaro, the believe unbelievers, the, the people that uh, hide the truth, that deny the truth, or blaspheme. Those, those are the meaning of the word kafar. Uh, means to hide it or blaspheme it or, or deny it. Unbeliever of the old used to say, Allah's curse be on them. I would like Mr. Badawi translate that uh, for us, give us the better translation of Arab or Arabic into English, because this translation, Yusuf Ali has really got it wrong. Allah's curse, again that word is qatallahum, again that word death, destruction. Asad translation says, may Allah destroy them, how they are deluded away from the truth. Going back to hadith, one hadith, so you see I'm not just pulling out of the, the Quran. Volume 4, book 56, number 660, Sahih Bukhari says, narrated Aisha, by the way Aisha was Muhammad's second wife, she married him when Muhammad was over 40 some years of age, and she was only seven years old when she was engaged, nine years when Muhammad took her to bed. Now in, in West, we have a title for that kind of behavior. But we can't say anything about Muhammad. Muslim can say, Jesus was not the son of God. You're allowed to blaspheme our God, but as soon as I touch Muhammad, I've got to be careful, because, well, what happened with Jesus? The Bible says, he who denies the son denies the father. You blaspheme, you say kof against Christianity, Mr. Badawi oftentimes argues that the Bible has been tahrif. It's a corrupted. This is not the true Anjil that came by uh, Prophet Esau. So he's allowed to blaspheme, but I couldn't touch. If I do that, Muslim in Pakistan will go into the churches and start killing people. How many? Five minutes. Here is Narada Aisha and Ibn Abbas. On his deathbed, Allah's apostle put a sheet over his face. And when he felt hot, he would remove it from his face. When in that state of putting and removing the sheet, he said, May Allah's curse be on the Jews and the Christians, for, for they build places of worship at the graves of their prophets. By that he intended to warn the Muslim from what they, that is Jews and Christians, had done. Against, again, they used to do this. That some of the Christians did that in that time. And so uh, you can argue against some of these because it's historical fact. Surah chapter 9 verse 31. They, Christians, take their priests and their anchorites to be their lords in derogation of Allah. And they take as their Lord Christ the son of Mary, yet they were commanded to worship but one Allah. There is no God but He. Praise and glory to Him. Now Mr. Badawi said, when it's talking about mushrikeen, or those who associate partners with God, it's not talking about Christians 
Again, he pulled one verse out of context. Here is the verse in the context because it says, Far is he from having the partners they Christian associate with him. So in other words, the Christians are Yoshrik. They are the Mushrik. And so again, both the Hadith and the Quran says that we associate partners with God. Verse, verse 32, fain would they extinguish Allah's light with their mouth, but Allah will not allow but that His light should be perfected, even though the unbelievers, al kafiruna again he's talking about Christians, and he's both calling us mushrik and kafar. Mushrik are those who associate partners with God, they're pagans. Kafar are those who deny or reject or hide the truth. Or we call them blasphemers, may detest. Surah chapter 9, verse 33, same, same chapter, same passage. It is he who has sent his messenger with guidance and religion of truth to proclaim it over all religion, even though the pagans, al-mushrikun, may detest it. We, there is no reconciliation between Islam and Christianity. Christianity, the God of Christianity has a son, his name is Jesus. And when he died on the cross, that was it. Muhammad came and he said, no, Jesus is not the Son of God. The Bible says Jesus is the Son of God. The Quran says he's not. One of those books are lying. And so there is no reconciliation between the two. Just for your information. In the above verses, Christians are called both mushrik and idolaters. Let's go back to Surah chapter 5 verse 17. In blasphemy, indeed are those, lagat kafara latina, that say that God is Christ the Son of Mary. Again, we are blaspheming, we are saying, we are speaking, uh, we are speaking kuf when we are saying that. Say, who then has the least power against God? If his were to destroy Christ, the son of Mary, his mother, and all everyone that is on the earth. Here is uh, uh, disrespect to Jesus, Allah is speaking. For to God belongeth the dominion of the heavens and the earth, and all that is between. He created what he pleases, for God has power over all things. Verse 72, they do blaspheme who say, Laqad kafara ladina, same thing, God is Christ the son of Mary. But said Christ, O children of Israel, worship God, my Lord and your Lord. Whoever joins other gods with God, innahu, innahu man yushrika billah faqad haram Allah alayhi jannat. Whoever joins other gods with God, God will forbid him the garden and the fire will be his abode. All Christians, one minute. You will go to hell. Asad and, and so on and so forth. Surah chapter, again, verse 73, he says, They blaspheme who say God is one of three in a trinity, for there is no God except one God. If they desist not from their word of blasphemy, verily a grievous penalty will befall the blasphemers among them. Let me read this. Book chapter 1, Hadith number 0284. It is narrated on the authority of Abu Huraira, the messenger of Allah observed. By him in his hunhan is the life of Muhammad. He who amongst the community of Jews or Christians hears about me, but does not affirm his belief in that which I have been sent, and dies in, his esta in this state of disbelief, he shall be but one of the denzians of hellfire. I don't know what denzians is, but it doesn't sound good, whatever it is. So... 30 seconds. I'm done. Yeah, All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor Safa. At this time, we will commence with our rebuttals. The rebuttals are 15 minute time limit. And Dr. Badawi, you're up first. Assalamu alaikum again. And if can, uh, we can get this on the screen, because this is exactly what I didn't have time to cover. One of the issues that uh, Brother Safa raised are the uh, alleged instruction in the Quran to fight the people of the book until they give jizya and feeling themselves humiliated. Response number one. Let me just get. Okay. First, I mentioned to you earlier outright that there are terms in Arabic and in the Quran that sound general, but there is evidence that it applies only to a subset, not all. So all these quotations are not to be generalized, that Brother Safa said. 
First of all, historically speaking, the enmity that was shown to Muslims was not only from idolatrous Arabs, it was shown as well by some other people from what you call people of the book, some of whom, like some of the Jewish tribes in Medina, betrayed the peace treaty with the Prophet and actually stabbed Muslims in the back at the time of the Battle of the Trench and made coalition contrary to their commitment with the enemies. Among Christians, many people were decent, and I'll speak about them, but there were those Christians, for example, among the Byzantians who gathered a huge army to invade Arabia and destroy Islam because it calls for egalitarian and they were big emperors. And that is the battle of Tabut. I don't know how could we neglect and leave aside all of those historical contexts among those particular people who called themselves Christian, violated Christianity and wanted to commit violence against Muslims. It is not to be generalized. Secondly, whatever you say about Hadith, I said it earlier, the Quran comes first. I'm not saying Hadith is not relevant. Quran comes first, and the most accurate hadith must be understood in the light of the Quran. I did quote the verse earlier in chapter 60 that says, if people are not fighting you because of your religion, driving out of your home, you treat them kindness and justice, and invasions and killing is not justice, is not kindness, and as such, it applies only to those who violated that and betrayed Muslims or committed violence against them. Aggression has to be stopped. Now, if indeed this was a general instruction to fight Jews and Christians, then that raises some logical questions. I said earlier, Islam, and this is the Medinan revelation. In the later revelation, it says a Muslim can get married to a Jewish woman or a Christian woman. If indeed they have to fight, I'm not talking about family fights, real fights with blood, how does the Quran allow even marriage which is a more intimate type of relationship? Historically speaking, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not fight his neighbor because one verse he did not even quote. I had it. I'm up front. Uh, that fight those who greet you about of the unbelievers. Because they're unbelievers? No. Because they were constituting threat to the Muslim community, including the big emperors of the Persian and Byzantian Empire and Muslim have to defend their borders. They didn't have any united nation. You have to defend yourself by yourself. Thirdly, he says that those who are not accepting Islam have to pay jizya. And he had a very uh, strange interpretation. I never heard of jizya, jaza. In fact, it is jaza, but not jaza, or in return for not accepting Islam. In return, jizya means in return for receiving the services of the state. Because under Islamic state, uh, truly Islamic state, I'm not talking about the 51 nation he's talking about, they're deviating from Islam. I'm talking about normatively in the teaching of Islam, all citizens, Muslims and otherwise, are entitled to all the services and they are exempt from being, you know, drafted in the army so that they don't fight against their own particular beliefs. Now, how do you finance the state if all the funds are coming only from zakah paid by Muslims? Why didn't the Quran say, but take zakah from Christians also so that you be equal? Well, if you tell uh, Christians to pay zakah, which is not only a tax, it is a religious concept, it is part of the pillars of Islam, you're insulting the religious feeling. Actually, he didn't mention to us something very important, that at the time of Umar, the second caliph after the Prophet, there were some uh, you know, people who did not accept Islam in Arabia and didn't like the term jizya. He said, all right, pay it as charity, just like Muslims pay zakah to contribute their share. Number two, when the question of zakah, it is not a punishment at all because if a person becomes a Muslim, he pays zakah, which is normally more than what he pays for jizya. Actually, if you calculate zakah, it's, it's actually more than jizya. Jizya is not set in the Quran, it's only a token. Number two, he says that they pay it and while they are humiliated. This is one interpretation that he gave. There are many great scholars like Imam Shafi'i and others. Say, an yadin in Arabic means if they are able, and that's known in Islamic law, that non-Muslim citizens who are living under the protection of Islam uh, are not required actually to, um, to pay that poll tax if they are not able to. And they say feeling themselves humiliated. Imam Shafi'i said no. Sagirun has a variety of meanings. But like I said earlier, the meaning must be contextual. If a person is not fighting, how come you force him to be humiliated when the Quran says treat him in kindness and justice? This again, what I call the cut and paste approach. 
And yet he says, Sagirun means accepting the authority of the state because those who fought Muslims before and then finally they were defeated, they're giving that as a token also, not only for receiving the services of the state, but as a token for peaceful relationship, which is far less than what Zakah uh, pays. Now, uh, Mr. Safa says that Mushrikun apply to Christians. I'm willing to pay one million dollars if he shows me a single verse in the Quran if Jews or Christians were called with the epithet Mushrikun. One million dollars, one place. Not to say that they committed shirk because shirk has variety of meaning in the Quran, one of which shirk. No verse in the Quran ever described Jews and Christians as Mushrikun, as he said, idol worshippers. Not one. Listen. Secondly, secondly, in Surah al bayyana the 80th Surah in the Quran, it made a clear distinction between Jews and Christians and idolaters. The word kafaru, and I explained the word kufra again. It says the be people who rejected Islam from among the people of the book and the idolaters, mushrikeen. The word mushrikeen was made as a distinct group for those who rejected Islam. Now, but he says, but that's kufr and infidelity. The term infidelity does not have the equivalent in the Quran when it speaks about Jews and Christians. And you have a million dollars there too. First of all, lots of millions are available. First of all, <laughs> okay, the word infidel the word infidel in the English language means someone who does not have a religion or someone who does not believe in God. Go to chapter 29, verse 46 of the Quran, and it says that Jews and Christians and, and Muslims worship the same God. Ilahuna wa ilahukum wahid. Here is the Quran saying they are believers in God. But the word kufr, Again, Mr. Safa gave only one meaning. You need some more depth of understanding of the variety of things. I mentioned that earlier about the usage of the language. Kufr has variety of meaning in the Quran. One is positive kufr. Positive kufr, that is rejection, to reject something. And it could be positive kufr, and there are verses in the Quran that says there is good kufr. It says anyone who commit kufr or reject Satan and believe in God, he is holding the tightrope of God. So there is positive kufr. It, it has variety of meaning. It has a neutral meaning. In the Quran, it describes the farmers who uh, plant, put the seed in the ground, that they are committing kufr. You know why? Because etymologically, the origin of the term, the term kufr is to cover up. So that's a neutral meaning, a farmer covering up the seed in the ground. But even in the negative sense, it's used in a variety of ways. And many of the verses that you quoted about Christian, in fact, would fall in that category. Being ungrateful. You could be a believer, but ungrateful. It describes Muslims who have the resources and don't go for hajj as kafirs. Woman kafara. But it doesn't mean they're not, not Muslims. Ungrateful to Allah. In other words, those who worship other than Allah, even though they believe in God in some way or the other, but they're not grateful to God who created everything, including all of his prophets. That is a theological statement of truth that we find parallel also in the scriptures and that. So it means that. But even if you lose it in a more negative sense, there is variety of meaning. It could refer to someone who rejects God altogether, that like the people of Noah and Abraham, after evidence has been presented to them. There is, it could also apply to those who believe in God, but reject a particular prophet, like Jews rejecting Jesus, for example, or Jews and Christians rejecting Muhammad. But the Quran, after all, says it is not because of your wishful thinking or that of the people of the book. Anyone who does wrong will be punished accordingly. So the question of judging people, I said that outright. I said, yes, there are things in the Quran that say what is right and what is wrong in belief and others. But it's not up to us to mistreat people or hate them. The Quran uses the term oftentimes about the brotherhood, even, even though people might not agree with you. The other thing that he referred to in hadith, and this is only one example to show the ki kind of lack of understanding also of the context of that hadith. So more than once he referred to the Prophet at, quoted as saying, don't uh, uh, begin greeting of Jews and Christians. Does he know, Mr. Safa, the background of this? The background is already in the books of Tafsir, that some people among the people of the book, Jews in particular, in Medina, when they came to greet the Prophet, they twisted the word as-salam into another Arabic word, as-sam, which means instead of peace be with you, death be with you. And the Quran in one verse actually say, when they come to you, they greet you in a way not greeted to by God. 
So what the Prophet basically told, because he didn't want to come to the level and tell a death with you too. And they twist the word so it sounds like peace be with you. So he said, all right, for them, not for all Jews and Christians, all the time, everywhere. He said, for those particular people, if they don't initiate greeting with them, they showed arrogance, they showed assault, unfair assault on Muslims and the Prophet. But if they greet, so if they greet you, say, on you too. So if they say, peace be with you, you're saying, you too. If they say, death be with you, you're saying, you too. So you're not t trying to just <laughs> dealing with them on uh, a level uh, ground. Uh, Mr. Safa was telling me, how do you translate uh, God destroy them? Actually, there are other translations also. You go, for example, to Muhammad Asad translation. He has, he has a long footnote. I have it with me here, actually. I can give a copy to Mr. Safa if he wishes or willing to read it. I said that idiomatically this was used by Arabic, by way of wonder, wonder. Just like say, how could you worship other than the creator of heavens and earth and all prophet? It's, it doesn't necessarily mean curse as some people translate it. Go to the translation by Yusuf, uh, by uh, Muhammad uh, Asad on this. Again, many statements were made about the Quran. I think uh, Brother Safa is, is willing, and I'm sure he should be willing. Maybe he can attend a course. I give a complete course in the university introduction to the Quran. His narration about what the Quran says, how what the Quran collected, what Uthman did. I would be willing to answer him if he would care to come tomorrow to correct all of this misconception that we find only in polemical type of literature. The other thing that I would say about the um, Jews and Christians being... Um, uh, condemned and so on, uh, and they should be driven from Arabia. The facts belie what is being said. And actually scholars of hadith, even in Bukhari and Muslim, Bukhari actually is more authentic than Muslim, not unlike what Saf Brother Safa said. Actually there are scholars of hadith who make the criticism of hadith not only by way of chain of narration, but textual criticism. And they said that any hadith, even with the proven chain of narration, if it contradicts the Quran, either has to be reinterpreted or to be discarded. Normally, there are interpretations like this hadith, for example, about greeting Jews and Christians, if we understand the proper context of it. The fact of the matter that Jews, even Jews themselves, lived in Arabia. Those who committed the atrocity against Muslims at the time of war and were exiled, and they went into another location. It was still in Arabia. It was still in Arabia. Secondly, at the time, even after the Prophet, during the reign of the second Caliph, Umar, we hear stories after stories that, for example, a Jewish old man was begging in the street, so he went to him and said, why are you begging? He said, you took jizya from me when I was young, but nobody cares for me. And Umar immediately ordered that the, uh, the Secretary of Treasury, as we call it today, go around and find any person like that to say, Ma safnak, we didn't do justice to you. How we take the jizya from you, just like the pension or social security that you pay? And that was years after the death of the Prophet. There are many other examples of Jews and Christians actually who lived. It might perhaps uh, be ne necessary also to comment on his claim that the Quran says non-Muslims are unclean and you have to wash your hands. First of all, it has nothing to do with Christians and Jews because it used al-mushrikun. And the question of being unclean is not physically, it is the question of their belief in idolatry. And he should join us as a good Christian in condemning idolatry. The house of Allah, the house of Abraham, was built for the worship of the one God, originally by Abraham. It was desecrated by the idolatrous, idolatrous Arab, and they put statues or idols inside and out. How could you have public peace when the holiest of the holy is accessible to those who worship idols? He says, well, they, they banished, the idolatrous Arab banished. The idolatrous Arab disappeared because they entered into Islam in mass. And the reason they entered in Islam in mass is when the Prophet went victoriously to Mecca in a basically bloodless entry without resistance. He stood at the Kaaba, the house of Abraham. And after he destroyed the idol that desecrated it, he says, you people, people who persecuted him and his followers, what do you think I'm going to do to you? And finally, he told them, I say to you unto, unto you what Joseph said unto his brother, you go. You are all free. No blame on you today. May God forgive you and forgive me and brother Safa as well. Thank you, Dr. Barwe. Pastor Safa, your rebuttal. You'll have an additional 30 seconds. 
You know, I really like Dr. Badawi. I like his translation of the Quran, and I'm serious. I would sponsor the publishing of his translation because apparently the entire Muslim world doesn't understand what he says because uh, they're persecuting Christians. Fifty-one. Now he says they are all in the state of uh, denial of Islam. I just started. What is it when I talk, this thing talks? It's, did you set it up like that? No. You've got 15. Shame on you, Sean. No. Uh, <clears throat> Again, going back to this utopia of that Mr. Badawi is creating, everything we read, he says, oh, it doesn't mean this. In Arabic, it means something else. I read a whole passage. He said, no, that's not what he says. Let me, let me say... Now, again, go on Islam online. I wish you all would speak Arabic. Because one of his closest friends, who he went to honor his status in Bahrain or one of the country, Mr. Gadawi, Yusuf Gadawi, he, this man has passed a fatwa that Christians, actually is Islam online in the Arabic saw, Christians are mushrik and kafar. And almost every scholar that I have studied, here is one, go over to the... Uh, Slide number, I guess it's 41. Here is uh, a man uh, translating surah that I read, 28 through 33. Sheikh Abdul Aziz Ibn Abdullah Ibn Abdur Rahman Ibn Ba'az. He must be important because he's got a long name. He says he held the position of Grand Mu Now listen to his position. And with all due respect, Dr. Badawi, I think this guy holds a lot of more credential than you do. He held the position of Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia, the presidency of many Islamic committee and council, the prominent among these being Senior Scholars Committee of the Kingdom, Permanent Committee for Islamic Research and Fatwa, the Founding Committee of Muslim World League. He was the Founding Committee of the Muslim World League. World Supreme Council for Mosque, Islamic Jus 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 Produ uh, uh, Produ Pro Producer. <laughs> no. Pro oh, you guys are so good in Assembly of Mecca, and the member of the Supreme Council of the Islamic University of al Madina, and so on. I mean, he's so long, it takes my 15 minutes. He says, thus the Quran labels Jews and Christians as blasphemers, al kafirun Now this is what he says. He's one of the top scholars of our current time. And he, he says, the Quran labels Jews and Christians kafirun and polytheists, al mushrikeen the Jews and Christians are both kafars and mushrik. They are kafars because they deny the truth and reject it. And they are mushrik because they worship someone other than Allah. Allah says, and then he reads verses I read for you. Here they are described as mushrik in Surat al-Ba'ina. They are described as kafars. As Allah says, interpretation of the meaning, again Surah chapter 98, verse 1, another chapter. Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn uh, blah blah said, refuting those who like Jamal Badawi, say that the word mushrikin cannot be applied to the people of the book. This is what Dr. Badawi says, and this is what Abdul Aziz says. It is most likely that the people of the book are included among the mushrikin, men and women alike, when this word is used in general terms, because the kuffars are undoubtedly mushrikin. Hence, they are forbidden. That's why in Saudi Arabia, friends, you're not allowed to go to any of the holy mosques after 1500 years. Now again, Dr. Badawi can argue that, that that's because they are out of, they don't understand the Quran. Dr. Badawi does. Let me read some stats, what's happening. You know, if what you're teaching is not practical, and what you teach, people don't understand, you know, God, it really confuses me. And please correct me. Of course, there's no more time for rebuttal, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand this. Why would God speak in a language only 20 percent of the world's population speak it, or I'm sorry, 20 percent of the Islamic world speak, or less than that, if it's 1.6 according to him. I calculated 1.3 1, 1 million, billion. That why would God speak in a language that only 20 percent understand it, and then you have to look like 20 translation. And, and with all of those translations, I've got 20 translations here of surah that I read and Dr. Badawi said that surah is no good. I've got all the translation here that says uh, one after another states that 
they use the word a friend, and Dr. Badawi argues against that. But let me read uh, some of the status of the Christian of the Islamic world. There are over 50 Muslim countries around the world. Most, if not all, incorporate some elements of Sharia, the Islamic law, in practice. Almost all of these nations have placed restrictions in their laws or constitution on other religions, such as Christians, making worship difficult and even dangerous. The rest of the region is further down the freedom scale. In Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Algeria, Tunisia, there are virtually no indigenous Christian communities left. Though some converts, they carry out religious lives in catacombs and expats quietly hold services. In Saudi Arabia, religious intolerance is official state policy. That's the birthplace of Islam. If they didn't get it, 10 minutes? If they didn't get it, you and I cannot get it. If Saudi Arabia is not getting what Dr. Badawi is saying, you think we are getting it? Are you kidding me? If all of those scholars in Saudi Arabia are refusing, the prince of Saudi Arabia, I'm going to read the statement this, this man made, but let me read some, I've got 10 minutes, so I better take my time. Since the National Islamic Front, formerly the Muslim Brotherhood, which I believe Dr. Badawi has got the same philosophy as Mr. Ghotb and... Uh, the others in Muslim Brotherhood, took power in Sudan in late 1980s. Two million people have been killed, mostly Christians and animists. In Nigeria, some 11,000 people have been killed in the last three years over the introduction of Islamic Sharia law. There is a similar death toll in eastern Indonesia where paramilitary militant organizations such as Laskar Jihad, allied to international terrorists, have slaughtered local populations. I had a Christian pastor with me in our, my office, that Muslims came with a truckload of, of gasoline, poured it over the Christian villages, hacking people in half if they would not accept Christ, uh, Islamic faith. Over half of Iraq's one million Christians have fled since coordinated bombing of their churches in August of 2004 was followed by sustained violence against them. A Catholic Chaldean bishop raised the possibility last month that we may now be witnessing the end of Christianity in Iraq. All of these nations that you see, most of them, every single one of them, that you see that there are Muslim used to be a center of Christianity one day. Anglican canon Andrew White who leads a Baghdad ecumenical congregation in Greece. All of my leadership were originally taken and killed, all dead. If you're supposed to be friend of Christians, and how Dr. Badawi translates the Quran, how come are, are all of these millions upon millions upon millions of Christians reading the Quran right, wrong? Then I would recommend all of us take an offering and let's print the Quran that Dr. Badawi translates. With all due respect. I'm for it. Iraq's Christian community, which dates from Apostle Thomas, is not simply caught in the crosshairs of sectarian civil war between Shiites and Sunnis. It is targeted for its non-Muslim faith, a reality U.S. policy fails to acknowledge. The West Bank, let's talk about Israel. The West Bank is hardly better. No one city in the Holy Land is more indicative of the great exodus of Christians than Bethlehem. I mean, I was in Bethlehem. Five minutes into my speaking, I said, Jesus is the Son of God. Seventy Muslims got up and they want to kill me on the spot. Respecting Christians? You kidding me? No one city in the Holy Land is more indicative of the great exodus of Christians than Bethlehem, which fell under full Palestinian control last decade as part of the Oslo Accords. This town of 30,000 is now less than 20% Christians after centuries in which Christians were the majority. In the West Banks, only all Christian town, now called Taibe, and once known by the biblical name Ephraim, a Muslim mob from a neighboring village tortured 14 houses last September. You think Christians are going to continue living there? You imagine if Medina today, Christians would arm themselves and go kill Muslims and empty Medina from Muslims? What country on the planet earth, Muslim country, do you know that a Muslim scholar or a Christian scholar could stand and say and blaspheme their religion? What Muslim nation do you think would allow a service like this? I would say all of you people of the faith of Islam ought to be grateful for America that is allowing you. That's right, sir. Listen. The public practice of non-Muslim religions in Saudi Arabia, the birthplace of Islam. Islam is the official religion with a legal system based on the Sharia law. 
Honey, if they don't get it, you don't get it. If all of those scholars in Saudi Arabia, the birthplace of Muhammad, cannot get it right, how are you daring to say you got it right? The public practice of non-Muslim religions is prohibited. Proselytizing by non-Muslim is illegal. And conversion by Muslim to another religion is called apostasy. Carries death penalty. Last year alone, according to CNN, the, the, the Saudi government beheaded 137 people in the center of the street, beheading them according to the Sharia law, according to the commandment of Quran. 130, most of them Christians. In accordance with the country's official interpretation of Islam, it is considerable, acceptable to discriminate against religions held to be polytheist. Saudi Arabia has one of the world's worst human rights records. Five minutes. Saudi Arabia is the most oppressed nation on planet earth. I mean, my plane flies over their airspace. I feel the fear that people dwell in that land. Women are still not allowed to drive their car. It's a property of people over there. So in accordance with the country's official, uh, Saudi Arabia, any person involved in evangelism or who converts a Muslim face jails, expulsion, or execution. This is the foreigners. I'm not talking about Saudis. Often false drug charges are used against those evangelizing. Even foreigners visiting are not allowed to gather for worship. Since 1992, there are more than 360 cases of Christian expatriates being arrested for participating in private worship. Despite this, the defense minister, Prince Sultan, Mr. Sultan, if you're listening to me, I've got a message for you. Told reporters in March 2003 that Christians are free to worship privately. Now listen to what he says. This is the prince of Saudi Arabia. They are, they are free to worship privately, but reiterated that no church buildings will be allowed. Well, underground churches are illegal. No churches are allowed. So where are they worshiping? In their bathroom? He said, we are not against religions at all. But there are no churches, not in the past, not the present, not the future. I don't understand this logic. It, a five-year-old may understand, but it, it, it bothers me. When he says religion are free, we're not against religion, but no churches are allowed in the country. No worship, any form of it is allowed. It's illegal to have a Bible in Arabic in Saudi Arabia. So much for loving Christians. The annual report of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom has placed Bangladesh, that's another country, on its watch list, indicating that if religious persecution becomes more intense, it could, place on the, it, it could be placed on the United States list of CPCs, country of particular concern. This goes on. Turkey, one of the seat of the Eastern Christianity known as Byzantinum, has one of the smallest Christian minority. I believe it's about, what is it, 70 people? Larry, correct me. How many born-again Christians are in that, in that land? About 1,000 people. That used to be the center of Asia Minor, of Christianity. Again, many of these countries state that. Today, it is now home to less than, this is 75,000 Christian, which is Coptic and Orthodox and all the other sects that are there, which we don't consider them. Anyhow, out of the population of 70 million, the persecutions, genocide, over 1 million Christians were massacred in our century at the hand of Muslim Turks. Last Sunday, Italian Catholic police Francisco Adriano Francini was stabbed after mass at a church in Izmir. In April, three evangelicals were mutilated and killed at their Christian publishing house. Again, we're talking about 1,500 years of persecution against Christians. Now, what tells me you are going to treat me differently? What tells me that you will not? How would I know? That what you say here and what you say behind a closed door is two different things. How would I know that you appear to me as friendship, but deep inside you curse me and you go and wash your hands because I'm unclean? How would I know that? What do I base this Christianity upon? Again, Father, we thank you for this gathering and honor you tonight. Lord, we do not want to create or provoke anyone here, but... Speak the truth, that maybe that truth, that little ounce of truth may appear to their hearts. And they may go search the truth. In Jesus' precious name. I want to encourage all of our Muslim friends and Christian friends. Grab a Bible 
in the language you understand and grab a Quran in the language you understand. If God cannot communicate with me in a language I understand, then he's messed up. And read one chapter of the Quran and one chapter of the Bible and see which one do you understand for your soul's sake. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pastor Safa. This time we'll take a 15-minute break. We'll reconvene and we'll post some of the questions that you wrote out on index cards. Thank you. I, I didn't say that because I have way more. We only have just six questions. I, I had six questions before we started. You got six on the yeah, I mean, I, there's no way we can answer all. If Christians and Muslims cannot be friends, I see only three scenarios for the future. One, total conversion of one religion to the other. This is highly unlikely. Two, total annihilation of the people of one of the religions. This sounds unchristian and unmuslim. And three, endless worldwide conflict. Not a pleasant sounding option. Please provide your comments. See, uh, when, we come, when we talk about truth, Truth carries an incredible weight in itself. You can compromise it. You can say, well, let's do it this way. Let's come around and let's do it this way. Let's do it this way. If it was possible to do it this way and that way, as we have heard suggestion tonight, then 1,500 years of Islamic history is proven wrong. Because, again, we have created this utopia that it's possible. But how is it possible that I be your friend when you blaspheme Jesus, my Lord and Savior who died for my sins, how could I be your friends when all of those verses calls me a, a mushrik, a kafat, and I need to be cursed? How could I, unless you say, let's put religion aside, let's not talk about religion, let's go outside and grab a cup of uh, tea and sit down and fellowship. Hey, I'm uh, nothing wrong with that. But when it comes to the weight of truth, that's why I want to talk about Mr. Badawi, because what he teaches on the internet about various subjects, it's really disturbing, the stuff that he says, because that's, I cannot be his friend. It's impossible for me to be his friend, knowing his opinion about America, his opinion about the Jews, his opinion about Christians. And yet, so again, when it comes to the truth, I, we cannot compromise it. But then that doesn't mean we have to hate each other. Uh, again, as I said, we don't have to hate each other. We don't have to spread lies about one another. Some of you were upset at me talking about Islam. I don't talk about you, I talk about your religion. And you disagree with me? Hey, this is a free country. Look at it. In Australia, they're putting a play on, they're, they're creating Jesus as a homosexual. We don't go in the Banner Street, behead those, those crazy Australian. Please, and, no comments from the audience. And we don't do that. So... What do we do? We say, well, you know, they're fools. And God is not intimidated by your opinion about him. How come that doesn't work? When they drew Muhammad's caricature in Denmark, over a hundred Christians were killed just in Pakistan alone. So my question to you is, how can we continue doing this when they're slaughtering Christians all over? You say, well, they're not, they're not Christians. Or they're not Muslims. Where are Muslims. Where are true Muslims? Where are true Islam? Where is true Islamic nation? And so that's why we have to discuss this and poke at each other till we get to the truth. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> Next question goes to Dr. Badawi. Why don't moderate Muslims speak out against radical Muslims? The problem is that Muslim moderates, as you call them, are not speaking. They have been speaking. The problem is that no one is listening. And when people listen, especially in the media, they don't report it and report it honestly. I'd like just to clarify one thing uh, concerning the question of disturbing material. Go to islamonline.net, type my name, Jamal Badawi, and look under... Uh, contemporary issues for my article that was presented in a scholarly conference. It's not only my idea, as uh, Mr. Safa is saying. 
It's a scholarly body of 36 scholars of the world. And it was accepted for publication in their journal that deals with the relationship between Muslims and Muslims. Go read it for self. You said it's called Muslim and non-Muslim relation. And just tell me, honestly, my email is available. What do you find disturbing there when basically why I said, what I said in this article years ago is basically what I said today. So the question of ranting of what this country is doing or what these people are doing, first of all, involves a great deal of exaggeration. I've never heard of anyone in Egypt legally or otherwise being jizya. I've never heard of Palestinian Christian being demeaned. Actually, Bitlaham is mostly, I was told by Palestinian, by Muslims. Actually, Muslims and Christians together were working in resistance to the Israeli occupation. I heard a Christian speaker from the Holy Land speaking about both Christians and Muslims being persecuted by the Israeli authorities. Now, let's be honest about it. Let's be honest about it. Uh, is the history, 1500 years of Islam, all negative or bad? Is the history of 2000 of Christianity all good and there is absolutely nothing? No crusades, no inquisition, no world war that, that, that killed millions. These are politics. And we're talking here theology and apparently we deviated from the question of theology. These are politics and wrong is wrong from either side. Thank you. Let me remind you that when you applaud in, in the middle of the three minutes that our speakers have been given, you are taking time away from them. So uh, if you'd please refrain from applauding until, until the end of the answer to a particular question. Next up, once again, Pastor Safa. It's my understanding that Jesus of Nazareth never intended to start a religion, but a movement, a relational revolution of the human heart, to love God and one another. Please comment. You know, Jesus came for one purpose, and that's that he brings you and I to God. As I said, for a, as a Muslim, I prayed for 20 years as a young kid. I remember as far back as I remember I must have been five years old when I got up early in the morning and had to learn that prayer in Arabic, not in Farsi, but in Arabic. I had to go to school to study Arabic for three years so I could understand what I'm reading in the Quran. Sometimes I travel 18 hours by train to go to a shrine of a dead imam so I could get one answer to my prayer. Not a single time God answered me. Not a single time God spoke to me. Not a single time did I have assurance that I'm forgiven. How many of you in this room believe that if you die tonight, all your sins are forgiven right now and you will go to heaven? Raise your hand. Put your hands down. That's what I was. I didn't have that assurance. You know, that's two minutes. I have two minutes. I thought you were raising your hand. I was about to <laughs> oppose you because Khadija asked Muhammad to forgive her sins. Muhammad said, I do not know whether my sins are forgiven me or not. And so I didn't have that. Do, do any of you Muslim have that assurance? Why do we go and work in a restaurant from morning to evening, and at the evening they say, we may give you a meal. We'll see if you've done a good job or not. Well, there is a restaurant down the street, serves a better food, and it's all free. You don't have to work for it. Jesus came to bring me to the Father. I came to the Father. I wish I had time I could show you a video to show you that Jesus is the Son of God and prove it to you that Jesus is the Son of God. You see, Jesus came because we couldn't approach God. Man cannot approach God. Islam, there was no need of Islam. God never sent a prophet outside of the Jewish race. Never. All of God's dealing was with one nation. What people? Jewish people. Out of the Jews, out of Abraham and his descendant, the Messiah had to come to the world. Muhammad didn't bring any new message that is not already in the Old Testament. You compare the Jewish law with the Islamic law. There is no way you can beat the Jewish law. Jewish law is the most perfect law. The Ten Commandments is the basis of constitution on this planet over. So Muhammad didn't have any message. God never spoke to any other nations other than one group of people. And out of that group, he sanctified him so that out of that Messiah, the Christ of God, the Son of God, would appear so that he could carry your burden, your sins and my sins. 
I never heard the voice of God. For 20 years I prayed as a Muslim. I fasted. I was six years old when I fasted 30 days in a row without drinking and eating. At night I would get up and do night prayer. But Jesus did that. That's, that's why Jesus is, comes into the heart. Religion is all here. Jesus goes all the way down and removes all of that jerk, all of that junk, all of that dirt. Hallelujah. I'm getting excited here. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Dr. Badawi, there are a number of questions um, about women and Islam. And this qu question fairly summarizes the others. And that is, what's the justification for restricting women's freedom in the Muslim faith? That is another myth. And before the three minutes are over, I'll give you a reference to read my book. It's available in soundvision.com. And type the title, it's called Gender Equity in Islam, where there are dozens of verses in the Quran that show that indeed normative Islam is different from the practices of some Muslims. I'm not saying all, some Muslims or many Muslims for that matter. And I stand by what I said earlier in my introduction, in my rebuttal, that we cannot understand Islam by simply pointing to exaggerated or true uh, um, uh, misbehavior of Muslims as individuals, groups, or state. Islam is what is in the scripture and the ultimate source is the Quran for this. So to say that there is um, a mistreatment of women in, the, in Islam, it is totally mixing the mistreatment of women by some Muslim, which is not in Islam. Suffice to say that in the Quran, women, men and women have the same spirit by the text of the Quran. Two, nowhere in the Quran does it point the finger to Eve as the reason for the fall of Adam or eating from the forbiddity. Not once it was mentioned that both of them were blamed because there is no concept of original sin in Islam. Number three, the suffering of women during pregnancy and childbirth is described in the Quran as a reason to adore mothers. And let me conclude with my favorite hadith. One man came to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and he said, who among all people is most worthy of my love and good companionship? The Prophet said, your mother. He said, who's next? Number two. He said, your mother. He said, who's next? He said, your mother only in the fourth time. He said, and your father. In Olympic terms, gold medal for the mother, silver medal for the mother, bronze medal for the mother, the father might get some consolation or appreciation certificate. This is a myth when the Quran speak about marital relationship. It says that the foundation of marriage is dwelling in peace, love, and tranquility, love and compassion. Love, compassion, and peace are the foundation of marriage. The Prophet of Islam said, uh, the best of you is the best of his family. And by the way, there are many historical challenges, even ancient, about the age of Aisha, the marriage of the Prophet. I'll answer that tomorrow, inshallah. The Quran, when it speaks about women, it speaks about the right of inheritance, but give man even greater financial responsibility because they take less. The man is fully responsible for the expenditure of the household, even if his wife is richer than him. The fact that some Muslims misunderstand, misapply, I don't care how many. Truth is truth. I don't care how many. I have no agenda, I have no politics in it. Truth is truth. I say my opinion independently on this and other issues. I again recommend that you go to find what are these disturbing things. Read my paper. Read my paper on apostasy. And I'm not the only one. There are scholars like Dr. Taha Jabir who had a book also. And there is a, a Malaysian scholar who challenges this notion that anyone who lives Islam automatically must be killed. So we need to read the facts. Go and read. I encourage that. you. Thanks that he said go and read Badawi's material. On your own, independent, without any preconceived ideas. That's the challenge. Thank, thank you. I'll give you an extra 10 seconds. Pastor Safa. Dr. Badawi can have all my time because I like his version of Islam. Okay. I mean that. It's not my only one. Lots of people. Whatever you say, I like. We are a diverse nation. Instead of enforcing closed mindedness, why not embrace difference and emphasize tolerance? Again, your question is wrong to begin with. We're not projecting intolerance. We're not putting Muslims down. We're not raising banners. I didn't come to your services, any of those services, and raise a banner and say, you're blaspheming our God, and we challenge you to a debate. 
We don't, we're not the one who carrying intolerance. And again, I go back to what the Bible commands us. God so loved the world. The Bible says, he who hates walks in darkness and doesn't see the light. So the, the intolerance is not from Christians. Today, you know what I did all day today? I fasted all day today and prayed for every single one of you Muslims. Not for Christians. I prayed for Dr. Badawi and every single one of you. Why would I want to do that if I hate you? And you know what I prayed? God, that they may see. Lord, heal him. Actually, I prayed for, for some of you that need healing in your body. I prayed for your healing tonight. Why would I want to do that if I hate you? And so, again, the intolerance is not... Now, that's my stance. And you challenge me, and that's my stance. I don't know what other, other Christians do. As a matter of fact, I sent two letters to people. I said, if you do not come there to love on these people, don't come there. Because we walk in love. And uh, we're commanded because we're born out of Jesus. Jesus is love. God so loved the world. And so again, the intolerance, what you're saying is, what are the, what are the, the points of, the, what was that the question again? It's confusing. The question was confusing. Let's say, read that again. The question please. was about uh, the point of in diversity and tolerance. Di diver intolerance. Diversity, we're allowed. Thank God for in America allows this. Thank God it's, we're allowed to do it. This is what we want on this planet over. This is what I like to have. I, you know, I've got a, a two hours. I preach to millions of Muslims every day on my network. And every day I sit there and talk to these, some of these government authorities. And I say, allow people to speak their mind. Allow people to speak their mind. Do you know how many people of our group are sitting in prison and tortured by Muslim hands? So the intolerant, there are no Christian nations where they're torturing Muslims because they're blaspheming Christians. So the idea of intolerance, there is not from our side. We would like, we are living together. The very fact that all of you Muslims are not living in your country, you live here, that tells me that you don't believe in their system. You believe in this system. And thank God for that. That's right. And so, again, uh, that, just differ differences doesn't mean we have to come and compromise. This interfaith thing that we all come together and we mesh our ideology together, it's, it's not correct. Because the truth is the truth. You can mix. It's not a mixed dressing that you can mix it up. And so, 10 seconds or 10 minutes? Okay. <laughs> ten, ten, yeah, 10 seconds. Thank you. Last question goes to Dr. Butterway, and, and there are a number of questions about uh, the general issue of diversity, and this is a perfect segue from the last question. If the Quran teaches religious diversity, how come countries that are primarily Islamic persecute and do not tolerate non-Islamic re religions? I would have to reiterate again and again and again. Islam is something the practice of people, whether they succeed, deviate in a different, different degrees, this has nothing to do with Islam. It's not that Muslims did not understand their faith. Let me just pose a question to you. If we're talking about tolerance or intolerance coming only from one side, would Pastor Safa say that the Crusades that were initiated by the Pope, the highest authority, with people having the cross on their chest, singing onward Christian soldier, entering Jerusalem and killing men, women, and children. Blood was flowing in the street. Would we consider that an act of tolerance? The Inquisition that gave Muslims either the opportunity to embrace Christianity or being killed or exiled, and some ships when they were exiled were drowned. Is that part of Christian intolerance? When the two world wars in which millions of people perished, these were not initiated by Muslims, is that Christian tolerance? The main difference, I suspect, between Pastor Safa and myself is that for me as a Muslim, I can see more than what he said about the intolerance of some Muslims in the, history, the 2,000 years of Christianity. In fact, many historians say Muslims have been far more tolerant than any other religion or nations in the world. When he tried to paint the 1500 years as evil, I spoke about the house of wisdom in Baghdad, Muslim cooperating with Christian. 
to the, the point that there are historical documents that they show that Muslims were very, very tolerant with them. And these are testimonies even from some non-Muslim, sometimes clergy. The difference is that when I look at the Crusades, when I look at the Inquisition, when I look at the various wars raised by Christian countries against each other or against Muslims, you can give a big list also of how Muslims were killed and being tortured also in prisons of Christian, quote-unquote, country. For me as a Muslim, I say, no, these are not true Christians. They're hiding behind the good name of Christ, and no matter how many, they're wrong. I would not be dissuaded if somebody says, but the Crusades was not a few freak people, they were masses. They're wrong. If they're wrong, they're wrong. But the big difference here is that I don't say that this is a product of Christian teaching. I don't say that this is a product of the Bible. I don't go to the book of Deuteronomy and other books that speak about violence and say, all right, this is because of the implementation of violence because I'd be committing the same kind of cut and paste for convenience that many people have been doing and are doing with respect to Islam. The main difference is I don't attribute that to Christianity but unfortunately, some people want to attribute anything negative to Islam with exaggeration, sometimes even with false information or exaggerated ones. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank both of our panelists for their, their insights. I wish we had more time to explore these issues in an even greater depth. But let's have one more round of applause for both Dr. Badawi and Pastor Safa. leave you with the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., which were delivered on Christmas Eve 1967, just a few months before his death. He said, if we are to have peace on earth, our loyalties must become ecumenical rather than sectional. Our loyalties must transcend our race, our tribe, our class, and our nation. And this means we must develop a world perspective. We must either learn to live together as brothers, or we are all going to perish together as fools. Once again, thank you for coming out this evening. At this time, I'd like to turn the program back over to Sean Moore for final remarks. Thanks, Annabelle. I appreciate that. I also, again, I'd like to just extend my appreciation on behalf of the Islamic Society of Tulsa for everybody that came out tonight. And uh, I'd like everybody just to kind of look around the room. I'm, I'm very proud this evening as a Tulsan to say that um, we are together here presenting divergent views in our community and I believe we are building bridges and it's great that we had such a professional um, presentation by both sides this evening and I think this just is going to lead to a better understanding and learning. Um, now what I'd like to do is to present just a few gifts. Again, on behalf of the Islamic Society of Tulsa, and I will start out with Hannibal. Thank you very much, Hannibal, for moderating this and for standing up to, uh, to take the challenge this evening. So, Hannibal Johnson. Okay, we did this in alphabetical order. Is that, is that how we did this? I'm trying to figure out how we, how we, how we did this. We started out with Jamal Bedwi all evening. I think I'll, I'll, I'll extend okay. to Reza. Is it money? Um, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure what's in, what this is. I wasn't responsible for putting these uh, gifts together. But it, Reza, what's that? All right. You and I? No. Thank you for all. Thank you very much, Reza. I appreciate the time you put into this evening. <laughs> Lastly, I'd like to thank Jamal Bedwi uh, for traveling this evening and, and uh, taking so much time into the presentation. We had a bit of a challenge. You know, it's kind of hard to give somebody from Halifax. I don't know if you guys know how far away that is, but it's, you know, I, I went there with my family a couple of years ago. I think it took us a day and a half to get there by plane. Um, so uh, dinner at the chalkboard was kind of out of the question. Um, so in, instead, we have uh, a, a plaque here. 
on behalf of the Islamic Society of Tulsa to present to Jamal Bedouin. So in closing, I hope that everybody has gleaned some insight from this evening. I, I was sitting thinking about myself as a child as I watched this evening and thought about how easy it was as, as that young person to simply take what I heard and believe that to be true. And as I aged and became a little bit more wise, I'm not going to go too far on that, but a little bit more wise, um, I realized that God has given us all the intellect to make decisions on our own and take the inputs that we receive on a daily basis and apply them to ourselves. I hope you guys have a very safe trip home. If you uh, would like, we have an open house tomorrow at the Islamic Society of Tulsa. That will be from 1 to 5. Jamal Bedley will be there. Um, taking questions as well as some others on our behalf. And if you would please fill out the surveys that were passed around, that would be great. I look forward to seeing you again at an event like this where we can all learn again. Go in peace. Thank you. <laughs>